As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This is to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. If any of you have been in churches for more than one Easter, you probably also experienced Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. And that's the Sunday that we take this passage usually and we celebrate this passage on Palm Sunday. This is Jesus. He is getting the people to give him a donkey so he can ride on this donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And while he does so, people are going to be waving palm branches. You know the story. We haven't read it yet, but you know the story. People are going to be waving palm branches and all this stuff. And Matthew does this thing where he quotes an Old Testament passage just so that you know that he knows that there is a backstory to this experience. Here's the problem. You and I generally read Matthew's quotations and not the original passage. And so I'm going to give you a little disclaimer here before we go farther today. I'm going to be reading a lot of Old Testament passages. And I'm going to tell you that the Old Testament passages we look at today, because Matthew is going to quote a lot of Old Testament passages in this passage, but I'm going to let you know that the Old Testament passages teach something different than Sunday school taught me about this passage. If I read this passage in Matthew just as it stands, the people, and I'm talking about everything we look at today, the people who taught me Sunday school gave me a particular impression of this passage that is actually not consistent with the Old Testament verses that Matthew quotes. So we've got a couple options. Either Matthew doesn't know the Old Testament and we should take the Sunday school answers for this particular passage. Or Matthew does know the Old Testament and he is intentionally dropping out pieces that he doesn't like because he's trying to prove a different point in the New Testament. Or Matthew knows the Old Testament and he knows his hearers know the Old Testament. He knows that these people are able to decode the number 14 and the word David and so they must also be super Jews. And so he is only quoting the portion of the New Testament that is obvious in the New Testament story, but leaving the rest of it to the person who understands the Old Testament to find it for himself. And I lean in that direction. The problem is that as we read the Old Testament passages, you will find things that are different from the traditional understanding of this passage. So, let's go. Let's see what we find. Zechariah chapter 9, 9 is the verse that Matthew quotes. But we're going to start in verse 8. I'll put it up here on the screen. It says this, But I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. This is the voice of God speaking through the prophet Zechariah. I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The Zechariah passage is interesting because it has the Messiah. It's God speaking, and he's talking about the Messiah who is going to enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now, that's interesting because, see, when I was younger, no one ever explained to me what the significance of the donkey was. Uh, Jesus riding on a donkey, you know, if, if you're the king, you ride a stallion, don't you? If you're a really significant person, you ride a really significant animal. 
It doesn't make sense that anyone would ride a donkey. And so they always just sort of skirted over that part in my Sunday school lessons. It was Jesus riding into Jerusalem as a king. It was the triumphant entry. It wasn't the donkey ride. That's the way they referred to it. But this is important. The donkey ride is different from a horse ride because a horse is what you take into battle. No one ever takes a donkey into battle. In other words, the donkey is a symbol of there is no war, there is no battle, there is only peace. When does a king ride a donkey? Either when he has already won the war or there's no war at all to win. Now in Zechariah, this guy comes victorious, right? And he proclaims peace, right? In Zechariah, this Messiah is riding on a donkey because he doesn't need the horse because he has already fought the battle, he has already won. The question is when we get to the New Testament and Matthew is quoting this verse to talk about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, it's obvious that Jesus knows what he's doing. Jesus is fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. It's obvious that Jesus knows this because he's the one who says, I'm getting into Jerusalem, I need a donkey. We're going to do this thing right. And so he gets the donkey, they're going to ride in and all that kind of stuff. But the question for the, for the Jewish people around Jesus has got to be two things. One, this is the Messiah moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the Zechariah 9-9 entering into Jerusalem. He's going to kick out the Ephraimites, whoever they are. You know, the Jewish people of that day might not remember who the Ephraimites are. He's going to get rid of the chariots. He's going to break the bow. He's going to declare peace. And And on the one hand, you're thinking they're really super excited about this Messiah moment. But on the other hand, I'm sure they have questions. Questions like, but wait a minute, Jesus. The people in Jerusalem want to kill you. Why would you be riding in on a donkey? Or, but wait a minute, Jesus. The victory that we're supposed to win still hasn't been won. The Romans are still in charge of Jerusalem. King Herod is still in the palace. Jesus... If you're going to ride a donkey, shouldn't you already have the victory locked up? I'm imagining there's some confusion there. And so what they're thinking probably, this is the way I would be thinking, what they're thinking probably is, okay, well, maybe Jesus is riding in on the donkey to let us know it's Zechariah 9-9, but he's actually going to do the victory in Jerusalem. So once we get into Jerusalem, it's time for Jesus to let loose and to win the victory against the oppressors, right? I'm imagining that's probably what they're actually thinking. And so they're all excited. And the disciples are like, okay, yes, let's do this thing. Let's jump ahead back in Matthew 21, verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And of course, the question is, well, why are they cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them on the road? Why are doing, we call it Palm Sunday because we picture all these people waving palm branches and putting palm branches on the road in front of Jesus. And what's the deal with all the cloaks in front? What's the deal with all the palm branches? And so as a kid, I was just always taught, well, it's just a red carpet. You know, they're just laying out the red carpet for Jesus. But then what's the deal with the waving of the bows if if that's going on? Well, it just so happens in the Old Testament, there is a reference when then this passage is talked about in the Old Testament, there is a reference to bows from trees, from branches, from trees. It's in Psalm 118. And so let's go back there. Let me show you what Psalm 118 says. It says this, Lord, save us. First of all, that's the word Hosanna. Hosanna is the Hebrew phrase for save us. Hosanna is not the Hebrew phrase for we praise you. Hosanna is the Hebrew phrase phrase for save us. So when they say Hosanna, they are quoting Lord save us from Psalm 118. Lord grant us success. 
That's not a quote when in the New Testament they're not quoting anything, Lord, give us success. What they're quoting is they're quoting the idea of here's the king who's going to come and give success to the people. Here's the king who's going to give success to his people, right? We always want the king to give us success. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's the quote. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us with bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So they get the branches from the trees because they are not just saying Hosanna. They are not just saying blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are reenacting Psalm 118 by picking up branches and saying, okay, join the procession. We're heading to the horns of the altar. The horns of the altar are um, the edges of the great altar where the sacrifice would happen in front of the temple. And so the sacrifice happens on the altar. The altar has bulls underneath it, and the bulls have horns. And so the horns of the altar are the horns of the bulls underneath the uh, altar where the sacrifice happens in front of the temple. They are saying, we're going to make a procession to the sacrifice, the sacrifice place. And so get your branches. We need something to burn. That's probably what they're saying here. Get the branches. We need something to burn. But anyway, get your branches. We're going to go. Matthew quotes this because the people obviously we're reenacting Psalm 118. Now, what's interesting here is that these people, if they're holding the branches, they must be thinking in their mind, what's next? This is the Savior, Hosanna. This is the King, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. They are thinking to themselves, this is the messianic moment. What is coming next? Now, they've got a couple options. What should the Savior do? Well, the Savior who comes into the town should immediately start killing Romans. That's what the Savior should do. Remember, in the days of old, the word Savior a long, 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 long time ago in the Bible was sometimes translated as the word judge. There's a whole book in the Bible about it called the book of Judges. And these people in the Old, Old, Old Testament, when the oppressors were being so oppressive, the judge would show up and save the people by killing the oppressors. That's the way the Old Testament book of Judges works. And so if Jesus is the Savior, Hosanna, save us, son of David. If Jesus is the new judge, then he should come and start killing Romans. If Jesus is the king, if he's the new king, he should show up and go straight to the palace and kick that Herod guy out. If Jesus is the king, the son of David, you know, the one blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he should kick out King Herod. But then there's also that passage idea about going to the temple. Let me show it to you again in Psalm 118. Psalm 118 it says it twice. At the beginning, from the house of the Lord, we bless you. We're blessing you from the temple. And then at the bottom, with bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar, which is in front of the temple. Psalm 118 is actually referring to the Messiah doing something at the temple. Oh, and it's not just Psalm 118. It was also in Zechariah 9. I don't know if you saw it, but it was also there. Take a look at it, Zechariah 9, 8. We'll put it up here. It says, but I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I'm keeping watch. See, the base camp for the Messiah, according to these two passages, is the temple. I'm imagining the Messiah, messianic, moment-minded people in Jesus' day were thinking, let's kill some Romans. Or some of them were thinking, let's get rid of the, the king, Herod, you know, in that palace. But for those who were the super Jews, for those who really knew what was going on, for the real insiders, they might have known that the job of the Messiah is to go to the temple. And it's at the temple that we deal with the oppressors. It's at the temple that we start taking care of the marauding forces. It's at the temple that we start showing people who's boss. Some of you know the story and you know what happens next at the temple. 
But try to suspend that previous knowledge just for a moment and keep yourself in the moment of surprise because that is exactly what Jesus does next. Uh, Let's read it. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Wow, a prophet from Nazareth. That's unbelievable. A prophet from Galilee. That's unbelievable. Verse 12, Jesus entered the temple courts. Yes, it's going, it's starting, it's happening. And drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This, I got to tell you, is backwards from what they expected. See, Jesus was supposed to go to the temple and kick out the oppressors. Jesus was supposed to go to the temple and kick out the marauding forces right? Jesus was supposed to go to the temple and sacrifice at the altar and inaugurate a brand new thing that he was going to do. By the way, the temple was built in a multitude of courts. There was an outer court and there was an inner court. And the altar was in the inner court. And so if you wanted to bring the bows from the branches, you had to go all the way to the inner court. That's where the altar was. That's where the horns of the altar was. And only men and only Jewish men were allowed in that courtyard area. And so if there were any children, if there were any women, they wouldn't make it into that inner court area. And so the people wanted Jesus not just to be for the insiders. He wanted to go all the way to the deepest part of the inside. But what Jesus does is he stays on the outside, the outer courts, the court where the women and the Gentiles and the children could be. He stays on the outer court and he's supposed to get rid of the opposing forces. He's supposed to get rid of the oppressive forces. He's supposed to get rid of the marauders, but he kicks out Jewish people. You see, the only people who were allowed to do business in the outer court were the Jewish people. The only people who were allowed to deal with sacrificial, sacrificial animals were the Jewish people. And they had every right to do so. They had every reason to do so. In fact, my dad spoke on this passage just last week. And um, he, like every other in his church, and he, just like every other pastor that I have heard for most of my life, and every Sunday school lesson I have ever heard for most of my life, talked about this passage in the same basic traditional way. It goes like this. Jesus had two problems with the people in the temple courts. Problem number one, they were doing merchandising in the church. They were doing commerce in the place that was supposed to be for prayer. That makes sense. Jesus said, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? And so the problem was they were doing business in the place of prayer. It was the commerce, it was the business, because commerce and business, that's considered to be secular, not sacred, not spiritual. And so by doing something secular in that place, you were doing something that was normal, average, everyday, secular, in a place that was supposed to be spiritual. That's the first thing that they say Jesus had a problem with. The second thing they say Jesus had a problem with is that the money changing always would have involved some sort of shaving off the top for the money changers because that's the way money changing works. When you transfer a dollar to a franc or a a euro to a pound, in the transfer, the middleman is always going to take a small cut. That's the way it works. It's the way business works. The middleman always takes a cut. And so Jesus was speaking against the impropriety of the money changers who were sort of stealing from their fellow Jews by doing this money changing thing. That's the standard party line traditional story. I don't agree with it. And you know why I don't agree with it? Because of all the stuff in the Old Testament. Let me show you. First of all, in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, we read this with regard to the tithe. God says to the people, every year you're supposed to bring 10% of all of your income to Jerusalem. 
there's a problem. If you're a farmer, 10% of your income might be hard to carry all the way to Jerusalem. And so God says this, if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. It was the rule in Deuteronomy. It was the rule that if you wanted to go to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice, you could, in fact, sometimes you should, transfer your sacrifice to cash, carry the cash with you to Jerusalem, and then exchange the cash for another sacrificial animal. And someone had to sell you that sacrificial animal, right? Someone had to sell that sacrificial animal, and it just so happened that a good, convenient place to sell a sacrificial animal would be in the area where the sacrifices were to happen, right? It makes perfect sense. And so why not set up a little booth right there outside the inner courts of the temple so that you could sell a sacrificial animal? In Deuteronomy, God lays it down as the thing they can do, and in some cases, the thing they should do. And so the people were just following God's rule. Number two, take a look at this one in Leviticus 27. It says this, Every value is to be set according to the sanctuary shekel, 20 geras to the shekel. What that means is the shekel was a unit of weight, which was also a unit of money. A unit of weight can be used as a unit of money because it's reliable. So a shekel of silver would be a standard amount of silver. Now here's the problem. In ancient times, it was hard to standardize because no one had scales that were electronic and precisely calibrated. And so the only way for you to know whether or not your thing was actually a shekel or not is to weigh your thing against another thing that is actually a shekel. And so standardization of units and measures is common in any good society. And so God did it too. He, in, he said, we're going to have a standard shekel. This is the sanctuary shekel. And it's the thing that is always going to stay the same. Here it is. You're going to keep it at the sanctuary. And that'll be the standard. Okay, so now if you have a whole bunch of silver and you need to figure out how much lamb I can buy with this silver, how much stuff can I buy with this silver, you have to compare your silver to the sanctuary shekel so that you know how many sanctuary shekels your silver is worth and that would let you know how much you can actually buy with it. In other words, what I'm saying to you is the money changing was required by God's law. Leviticus 27 tells us that every value has to be determined by the sanctuary shekel. The money-changing thing was required by God's law. Okay, so in God's law, the idea of changing things into money and then out of money, purchasing sacrificial animals, and the idea of exchanging your silver for sanctuary silver, both of those things are in God's law. These people were obeying God's law. So is Jesus upset with the money changers? I don't think so. Is Jesus upset with the fact that they are purchasing animals? I don't think so. Both of those things were in God's law. These people were just obeying. So then the question is, why is Jesus upset? Why is he throwing a tantrum in the temple? Why is Jesus so upset by these people? Well, would you like to know it's also in the Old Testament? Jesus happens to quote a couple Old Testament passages here. And if we look them up, we might see what was on Jesus' heart and his mind as he's whipping the people and turning over the tables. It's in Isaiah 56. Take a look at this. Beginning in verse 6 and 7, it says, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. There it is, house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. There it is. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 56. My house will be called a, called a house of prayer for all nations. But maybe you missed just as much as the people of Jesus' day missed. And so I'm going to read it to you again. Let's go back to the beginning of it. And foreigners, okay, 
This whole context, first of all, is about non-Jewish people. The context is about the foreigners. And there's something about these foreigners that the prophecy wants us to know. The foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to Him. These are foreigners who choose to be worshipers. Foreigners who say, I know He's the Jewish God, but He's also God. And so I'm going to worship the Lord myself. They choose to minister to Him, bind themselves to Him, to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants. They keep the Sabbath without desecrating it. They hold fast to God's covenant. They're foreigners, but they're getting it right. These, God says, I will bring to my holy mountain. Which, by the way, just for a moment, file in the back of your mind the words holy mountain. File in the back of your mind that Jesus is talking about a passage where God is saying, I'm going to bring foreigners to a mountain. There's something about a mountain that might show up later in this passage. Something that might be interesting to us in a few moments and help us to understand in a few moments what Jesus might be talking about when he uses the word mountain later on. Because Isaiah 56 talks about the temple being on the holy mountain. And, go to the next one, give them joy in my house of prayer. On the holy mountain is the house of prayer. And these people are going to have joy. Why? Because their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus says, the foreigners, the outsiders, or Isaiah said it first, the foreigners, the outsiders, who bind themselves to God, who get it right, are going to be brought into the temple. Their sacrifices will be accepted because my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Interestingly enough, the word nations in the Greek is sometimes translated with a capital G as the word Gentiles. It's the same Greek word. Sometimes translated nations, sometimes translated Gentiles. Foreigners in Isaiah 56 will come into the temple and their sacrifices will be accepted because my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus is upset because something is going on in the temple of his day that is wrong according to Isaiah 56. See what's going on? These people are following Deuteronomy. These people are following Leviticus. And they're doing it in absolutely the most convenient way possible. Where better to buy a sacrifice than in the courts around the temple? Where better to exchange your money than where you're going to buy the sacrifice? I mean, these are the two essential components of religious Judaism. It, it's just religious people doing religious stuff. I mean, God commanded it. It's religious people doing religious stuff for religious reasons to help other religious people get their religious stuff done. It's Jewish people who are providing Jewish services to other Jewish people so that those other Jewish people can get their Jewish religious stuff done. Jewish people serving Jewish people for Jewish reasons. Religious people serving religious people for religious reasons. That's what's going on here. But you know what's not going on? I did tell you that the inner, inner court was for Jewish men only. And the outer court was for women and children and Gentiles. You've got to realize the closest a Gentile could ever get to the temple of God, the closest they could ever get to the altar of God, pragmatically speaking, was in this outer court called the court of the Gentiles. The very place where the religious people we're doing religious things for other religious people to serve their religious needs. I declare to you that Jesus was upset in this moment, not because the temple was being used for commercial purposes, not because the temple had some sort of, you know, impropriety happening with the money changing. I claim to you that Jesus was upset in this moment because the people who were the insiders, the temple was operating under practices of prejudice and exclusion. 
The religious insiders were using this courtyard to do their religious insidery games. They were doing their religious stuff for religious reasons, for religious purposes, for religious people. And all of the outsiders who might have come in couldn't because it was clogged with the people who thought they belonged there. They couldn't pray because the commerce was so distracting. How would you feel if you had traveled all the way from Persia to Jerusalem because you had heard the stories about Yahweh of old, the God of the burning bush, the God of the Egyptian plagues, and you were coming to Israel because you had finally decided you were going to make a pilgrimage to this city, Jerusalem, and celebrate the Passover, which was coming up this week, along with God's people, and you had traveled all this way, and you come into the place, and they say, sorry, you can only go this far. You cannot go any farther. And you're like, okay, that's fine. I understand I'm not a Jew. I'm coming from a long ways away. I understand there are certain requirements that people probably have. There are certain requirements that God probably has. And so I know I can only go this far. And then you are in the outer courts and you're preparing yourself to just experience the presence of God and spend some time in prayer and maybe hear through the wall a sacrifice happening on the other side and maybe get a glimpse of a priest doing the sacrifice. But everything around you is just Jewish religious people doing their Jewish religious thing. A cacophony of sheep and goats and people bartering and arguing and claiming that they know how much this thing weighs or how much it's worth. As an outsider, would you have felt in? No. And I know people would say, oh, but wait a minute, Jeff. No, no, no. You're, too, you're interpreting too much based on the Old Testament. You're taking the Old Testament passage and you're applying it to the New Testament situation. Jesus is just quoting a line. This is really just about commerce. It's really just about thievery. After all, didn't Jesus say that they were turning it into a den of robbers, right? That's the thing. No, Jesus is talking about a den of robbers. So Jeff, keep your mouth shut about the racism. Keep your mouth shut about the injustice and prejudice and exclusivism of that thing. And just don't, don't address that because that's not appropriate. Jesus called them a den of robbers, right? That's the alternative. Okay, I'll one-up you on that. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, where the passage about the den of robbers is quoted from. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. It says, will you steal and murder? Okay, stealing. There it is, right at the, it's at the very beginning. Okay, the people are stealing. Will you, this is God speaking to the people of Israel in judgment. He says, will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a, become a den of robbers to you? But have I, I have been watching, declares the Lord. See, here's the thing. That den of robbers passage, I could spend 10 minutes going through the translation of the word robbers to support my case here. But I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is focus on the fact that that verse we just looked at is not about the robbery at all. It's about the den. The verse was, these people are doing all their wicked things. They're worshiping Baal. They're being unkind to the people around them. They're being vicious. They're just being bad human beings, and they're not following God. And then they run over to the temple, and they say, oh, but here we're safe. We're safe here, and that's when God shows up, and he says, is my house a den of robbers? The emphasis is not on their robbery or their behavior or whatever else it was that they were doing. The emphasis is on the fact that they were treating the house of God like it was their safe place. The house of God is the place where no one can get them. The house of God is the place where they can say, oh no, we're, we're safe here. They already are robbers. They were treating God's house like their den. That's the problem. They were taking up the space in God's house as if it really was theirs. 
And Jesus, I imagine, would say, who do you think you are thinking this is your house? This is not your house. This is not your den. This is my father's house. And my father gave this part of the house to the Gentiles. My father gave this part of the house to them. And so he kicks them out. And here is the scariest part of it all. I'm going to show you Zechariah 9, 8 one more time. It says this. I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I'm keeping watch. In Jesus' story, who are the oppressors? But the Jewish people who are using the outer court, which didn't belong to them, as if it did. They were taking their religious privilege, their religious perspective. They were following God's law. Oh, yes, they were, but they were following God's law in the way that was most convenient to them and not at all convenient to the people who were supposed to be worshiping there, supposed to be praying there, the outsiders, the Gentiles. And that means that Jesus is treating the insiders as the oppressors. And that's why he kicks them out. Because God's house is for the foreigner too. The house of God isn't just for the insiders. It's for the foreigners as well. All of the passages that we've been looking at from the Old Testament, I find entirely fascinating because all of the Old Testament passages put together tell one very clear story that the New Testament story fits in perfectly. If you ignore all the Old Testament passages, then you just have a New Testament story that looks like it's just a bunch of people who are doing the wrong things in church. And so let's get rid of the, the wrong people doing the wrong things in church and let's get back to a pure and holy, you know, church experience thing that's really just for the church people. But no, what Jesus does is he says those people who are the insiders are sometimes the oppressors. And the people who are the insiders sometimes need to get kicked out because other people need to be in. 